this morning, Heavenly Father, I pray that your word would enlarge us and create and stimulate a passion and a desire for more of God than ever before. When I serve, I will rise up above my circumstances and I will soar in the potential and in the purpose of heaven. When you can hear the voice of God, every time when God speaks to you about your life, authority is released into your spirit. And if God said yes, who dare say no? (laughs) Thank you, Father, that the presence of the Holy Spirit and His influence and His awareness, His involvement, His work in our lives is relentless. And Father, that He will not give up on us ever because of the blood, because of the cross of Your Son, the Spirit of the living God, has come into our lives for all eternity, never ever to leave us, but to be with us for all time. I want to speak to you this morning about a very important issue, something that is not necessarily clearly understood by the church by and large, the issue of jurisdiction. We all understand the word authority, and then we're going to come to this word jurisdiction. I know this is the Republic of Brits and you use a word like that, you can, you can get in big trouble. <laughs> so let me explain the word jurisdiction. It's a legal term. And in doing so, let me put it this way. Imagine you are the chief magistrate of a small little town called Warmbath, Barambak. Now you are the magistrate that has been authorized by the Department of Justice to function there as the chief magistrate. Because you've been appointed by the Department of Justice, you are legally, legitimately in the power and in the authority to do everything that the magistrate is supposed to do. To preside over court issues and so on and so on, But you have a particular area in which you must exercise your authority as a magistrate. It's called jurisdiction. Jurisdiction means the area, the geographic boundary in which you are authorized to function in that office. And so now, this magistrate in the jurisdiction of the city of Warmbath, Warmbath, He's going on holiday, and he goes to Cape Town. But he takes his black suit with him, and he takes his law degree with him, and he takes the papers by which he was authorized by the Department of Justice to be a magistrate. So my question to you is this. Does he have the authority to be a magistrate? Amen. Who has given him that authority? The Department of Justice. He has the right clothes to wear. He has experience. He has a law degree. And as he comes to Cape Town, he sees the magistrate office of the city of Cape Town. He walks into the offices, and now he wants to take a seat on the bench. They ask him, sir, who are you? He says, I'm magistrate so-and-so. He shows them the paper, shows them his degree and everything. And they say to him, sir, you have the authority to be a magistrate, but do you have the jurisdiction in Cape Town to sit on this bench? What is your jurisdiction? What is the area? What is the geographical boundary that limits you in your authority? You see, come on, saints, let me talk to you about being a Christian. The issue of authority means that you have the right to do certain things. And authority means I can do those things because God said so. Come on. What is it that you know that you can do because God said so? When John the Baptist, when he baptized all the people, they wanted to know, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Are you the prophet? Tell us something about you. And when he did not tell them what they were expecting to hear, then they said to him, but then by whose authority are you baptizing? You see, he had the authority to baptize the people because later on in John chapter 1, he says, the one who sent me to baptize told me to look for the Spirit. 
And he told me that the one upon whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, that is the one who baptizes with the Holy Ghost. So John the Baptist had a particular mandate. There was something specific he had to do. Because God said so. So authority simply means the things that I do, the things that you do, the specific things that you are called to do, because God said so. <laughs> so when God speaks to a man, God speaks to a woman. When you can hear the voice of God every time when God speaks to you about your life, authority is released into your spirit. And people can try to oppose you. People can try to challenge you. But you cannot be stopped. You cannot be delayed even. You cannot be deterred because God said so. And if God said yes, who dare say no? <laughs> so I have authority to do certain things. Some of you have, this, you have a different kind of authority. Some people have the authority to write books. And when they write those books, they sell. Other people, they have a desire to write books, and when they, when they write them, they don't sell. <laughs> Some people have authority to write songs, to lead worship. Other people have authority to go on missions. Some people have authority to do miracles. Some people have authority to preach the word with understanding and clarity. So authority means that which you do, which is specific, and you do it because God said so. But what is your jurisdiction? What is the area in which you are called to function? And can God enlarge your territory? Can he enlarge your jurisdiction? Well, that's a very interesting question. How many of you believe that as you are faithful and as you are, are sensitive to the instruction and the guidance of the Spirit, God can release the jurisdiction? But the issue of jurisdiction is not going to be very, very, very relevant if you don't first understand your authority. You've got to hear something from God. There's something that you've got to do because God says so <laughs> in your spirit. Because my sheep hear my voice. If you're a child of God, then don't say, listen, I can't hear God speak. You can't hear him speak because you're too busy. You're simply too busy. And you need to teach yourself how that at the same time when you are busy, at the same time when your outer mind is busy with your activities, the inner mind can be busy with the presence of God. You can be tuned into hearing His voice even when you're in a crowd. <laughs> so here is Joseph. When he got the dream... Can you guys remember the guy from the Bible by the name of Joseph? And Joseph had a dream. Then he had another dream to confirm the second dream. So that Joseph will not be uncertain about his authority. So God authorized Joseph in a dream that you are purposed by the throne of God, by the mandate of heaven, by the intention of God to be a ruler. That is your authority. Wherever you go, wherever you find yourself, what is in your spirit is going to cause you to rule. So he's a young ruler. Because that is his authority, because God said so. But do you think that Joseph's jurisdiction was at home? <laughs> the, the area in which he was to govern and rule. It wasn't at home. So his parents' house was not the same as Potiphar's house. Potiphar's house is not the same as the prison house. And the prison house was not the same as Pharaoh's house, which was the royal house. But in every change of season, in every change of what God was bringing to Joseph, there was an enlargement of his jurisdiction, but it was the same authority. <laughs> My authority was that I am destined and authorized by God to rule in the midst of my enemies, in the midst of my circumstances, in the midst of my challenges. I am a ruler. So he walks around at home and he says, I'm a ruler. God said so. But you see, now it wasn't time to rule. It was time to learn. It's not time to rule. It's time to learn. And so when he was thrown into the pit, the learning began. <laughs> Big time. So Joseph was in the house 
his parents' house. And then the moment he moved to Potiphar's house, his authority was now relevant because his jurisdiction had come to him. Jurisdiction means the area where you can exercise your authority. And you cannot expect, you cannot experience your jurisdiction being enlarged unless you learn what you're supposed to learn in the current season of your life. No matter how effective, no matter how productive, no matter how useful you are to God right now, no matter how gifted you are, no matter how anointed you are in your current season, every man's current season, no matter what the assignments are that he is busy with, your current season is always in some way, it is a preparation for the next season. <laughs> so here is Joseph, as God prepared him through his experiences, he comes into Potiphar's house and he has to learn a principle. Because this morning, I want to speak to you about the clear voice of God and the vague voice of God. Say with me, the clear voice and the vague voice. My sheep hear my voice. But sometimes the voice of God is a clear voice and other times it is a vague voice. And I want to show you this morning how that the vague voice of God releases the supernatural. It releases the miraculous. But it's the clear voice of God that will show you your direction and get you moving. But once you are moving, it is the vague voice that is going to cause the supernatural. That which is not possible to man to begin to manifest in your life. So here is Joseph. And remember, the promise of God always speaks to your future. So when he was at home in his parents' house, God spoke to him in a dream and God gave him a promise. And the promise spoke to him about his future. That is the clear voice. But the vague voice will always speak to your character. <laughs> and you've got to pick up something in your spirit, in your character, man, about what is the principle. So what is the principle that God was trying to communicate to Joseph, which he had to embrace so that he can come to the next season of his life and God can actually enlarge his jurisdiction and he can begin to function at a new level, in a greater geographical position, that which he was authorized to do, and I'm authorized by heaven to be a ruler. So what is the principle? It's very simple. He had to pick up something in his spirit. You know what it was? This is the word that came to him in his character. If you want to change something, then you have got to do something. <laughs> so as he came into Potiphar's house, and he is now experiencing the rough edges of injustice. He has to make a choice. He has to make this choice. And you and I have to make the same choices. We're going to stand before the same challenges. When you experience that you are being robbed. When you experience that there is injustice. When you experience that things are difficult. You can make a decision. And this is the decision. Either I'm going to sulk. Or I'm going to serve. If I sulk, then I will surrender to my circumstance. When I serve, I will rise up above my circumstances and I will soar in the potential and in the purpose of heaven. So he comes to Potiphar's house and he says, well, I can sulk about my situation or I can serve myself out of my situation and serve myself into a place of authority. And he began to rule. Jurisdiction will always limit your authority. And when your jurisdiction is enlarged, it will release the potential and the significance of your authority. So when he was in Potiphar's house, could he now to begin to function in his authority? Come on, speak to me. He could. Because Potiphar gave everything over to him, except what was on his table. So now he was authorized to do things which was not normal for a slave to do. He had come to a place of authority. Even when his, the tag on his clothes said, slave number so-and-so, we paid 20 pieces of silver for this boy. Joseph at that time had 10 brothers, so they all went home with two pieces of silver. <laughs> when they took the money, it held them in prison to never come and speak the truth to their father, who was then in sorrow. And in sadness for years. 
You see, the money thing will always come to secure and to seal off what had been done that is wrong. That is why Judas Iscariot, when he sold Jesus, he sold him for 30 pieces of silver. But when he realized what he had done, he couldn't keep the money anymore. He threw it back. Galatians chapter 2 verse 6. Authority and jurisdiction. Two very important apostles at the start of the church. The apostle Peter and the apostle Paul. And now this is the apostle Paul writing about how that when he met Peter and them, having gone to Jerusalem, they're from verse 1. I just want to pick it up from verse 6. And Paul is writing certain things and he's saying, but from those who seem to be something, he's talking about the other apostles. Paul was really a no-nonsense guy. He was not impressed with the stuff you did in the past. Paul wanted to know what is the level, what is the substance of spiritual life that you are currently moving in. Not in the past. What, where are you right now with God? He says, but from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. <laughs> How about some protocol, Paul? How about giving honor where honor is due? He says, well, I don't, I don't sense it's due now. <laughs> Let God honor them. And I'm not asking for your honor either. This is now the apostle Paul. It makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. God does not have favorites. God only has favor. And whoever understands the principles of wisdom that will unlock the favor of God, they can go and claim it. There are some principles that unlock the favor of God. And it's your responsibility. It is for you to figure it out. God shows no personal favoritism to any man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. Verse 7. <laughs> but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised. Say with me, the uncircumcised. I want you to encircle that word because the uncircumcised means the heathen. It means non-Jewish. He's now talking jurisdiction. Can you see that? He's talking about himself. He has the authority to take the office of an apostle because he was authorized by God to be an apostle. He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He says, the will of God is the authority behind my office. That is my office. That's my authority. And he says, Peter has the same authority. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He has the same office as I have, but he has a different jurisdiction. <laughs> but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. Can you see now he is saying, Peter has jurisdiction in Jerusalem. I have jurisdiction in Antioch. I'm just summarizing. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised. Wow, the apostleship. That means the office. That means the authority. But for the circumcised, that's the jurisdiction. The area of his operation and function. Is this clear to you guys? I mean, when I started and I said jurisdiction, I saw some of you frown. It's not that difficult, is it? Because you also have authority and you also have jurisdiction. I want to share three principles with you this morning that will cause you and help you. It will empower you. It will enable you to enlarge your jurisdiction. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised, that means the Jews, also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. He says, so Peter is the apostle supreme, so to speak, for the Jews. And I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Verse 11, a very interesting thing happened there in Galatians chapter 2. Let's go to verse 11. I want to show you something this morning. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, now, <laughs> when Peter goes to Antioch, is Antioch really his jurisdiction? Is that really his field where he is supposed to operate? And because he is not in the sweet spot, in the correct place, I'm not saying he shouldn't have gone. I just want you to see something. So when he's not in Jerusalem, and he's under pressure. The pressure might cause him to deviate from the righteousness of God in his heart. 
And it actually happens. When Peter had come to Antioch, because this is the place where Paul, he has the jurisdiction to function then in the fullness of his authority. When Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. He said, I opposed Peter. I rebuked him in the presence of all the people. Come on. I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Verse 12. For before certain men came from James, so some people came from Jerusalem. Okay? But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. You know what happened? Peter understood the gospel. The gospel meant it's no longer the Jewish people as God's people. And then, you know, the Bura and the Zulus and the Tswanas, you know, you guys are from Africa. God help you. You're not a Jew. Those days were over. The middle wall of separation was broken down at the cross. And he made both the Gentile and the Jew. That means he had made us one in Christ. So Peter was sitting with the people of Antioch, the non-Jewish people, black and white, colored, Chinese, doesn't matter. Peter felt at home among the rainbow nation. <laughs> And he was eating with him until people came from Jerusalem and suddenly he realized, listen, I'm not supposed, I'm a Jew. I'm supposed to be, you know, we're supposed to be separated. So we went back to the law and Paul saw this. And how come Peter now slips when he very well knows and he's an apostle, he has the authority. But you see, that's not really, in his, he's not in his jurisdiction. When you're out of your jurisdiction, you're not as strong as when you are. On the platform that God has called you to function. I want to share three things with you. Three keys that are vital. That are important. That are essential. If you can embrace them, it's going to enlarge your jurisdiction. Key number one. If you want the jurisdiction that limits your authority to be removed and enlarged. Point number one. Every time when you face opposition, you've got to stand your ground. Every time when you face hardship and difficulty, you have to stand your ground. When you stand your ground, the enlargement, the limitation of your jurisdiction is being removed. The second point, you have to discern the voice that speaks to you. You have to learn how to discern the voice that speaks to you, and you have to respond correctly to that voice saying that let's quickly go to first kings chapter 18 because i want you to capture something here this morning when god speaks to us he speaks to us in two ways he speaks in a clear voice and he speaks in a vague voice and if you can hear both the clear voice of god and you can hear the vague voice of god you're going to see the power of god <laughs> I want to see your power in my life, Lord. I want God to show up in my life on ground level. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. And Jesus doesn't go around and say, He anointed me. He anointed me to do something. To break and remove the darkness upon people. To restore the brokenhearted. To declare the acceptable year of the Lord. A time of breakthrough and prosperity and victory, unlimited. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. The word of the Lord came to him. But Moses said in Deuteronomy 30 verse 14, don't turn there, don't go there. But Moses said to follow me, he said, near you is the word. <laughs> the word is in your mouth and the word is in your heart so that you can do it. Moses said that in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 14, near you is the word, it's in your heart and it's in your mouth. And then Paul, Paul quotes it in Romans chapter 10. But so the word of the Lord is near Elijah, but now it comes to him. It was there all the time, but now it comes to him. Go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. Would you say that is a clear voice or is that a vague voice? So the moment he hears the voice of God and it's a clear voice, he can now to move in the plan of God and he can start to mobilize the movement so that they can all see and they can engage the moment when the power comes. So what did Elijah do? Immediately, he packed his bag, he took his little cosplay 
in the Melrose cars, Provitas, put it in his bag, and there he went now. So he's moving in the direction of Samaria because that's where Ahab was, but he does not know exactly where Ahab is because God didn't tell him, but he knows this is the will of God. This is the clear voice of God, but he does not know how it's going to work out. So eventually, during the day, now he finally meets Ahab. The moment he meets Ahab, guess what? He tells Ahab, get all the people together on Mount Carmel. Did God tell him that that morning? So when he heard the word, go and show yourself to Ahab. Present yourself to Ahab and I will descend rain on the earth. That's a clear word. And near you is the word. It's in your, it's in your heart. So when God spoke to him to go and show himself to Ahab, was it the word in his heart or was it the word in his mouth? It was the word in his heart. It was while he was praying and spending time with God, God spoke a word in his heart. But the moment he met Ahab and he said to Ahab, get all the people together, we're going to have a showdown at Mount Carmel. And get all the prophets of Baal, 450, get them all together. And we're going to have an altar. And the God who answers by fire, where did he get all of this? It's the same word, but it's not the word in his heart, it's the word in his mouth. Because do not be afraid what you will say, because in that hour, it will be given you what you must say. And now it was the hour for God to speak. And it wasn't time, there was no luxury for the the prophet Elijah to go and pray, because here's Ahab, okay, God, Ahab is here. Ahab, he said, no, I'm presenting myself to you. Let me just go and hear what God wants to say. No, no, now's not the time for the word in your heart, it's for the word in your mouth. It's the word in the moment. 